Great, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, people always ask me, what's tax got to do with birds? Um, I can't really give them an answer for that. I just happen to like both at the same time. So surprisingly, I am not discussing tax today. I know a lot of people in this room <laughs> can see Kerry's face, a shock horror. Um, I, I know a lot of people do know about the, the tax success story that we have, um, but today Kevin has roped me in um, to talk about privately protected areas. So I feel that we're taking a little bit of a step back now. Um, we've discussed the nitty gritties, 101 of revolving funds, 101 of offsets, 101 of BE, um, but to bring it back into context is really to look at what are privately protected areas. And uh, I think with the Australian counterparts, it's a term that they use very frequently. And in South Africa, it's not a term that we use a lot. And um, I was involved in uh, the resolution that the IUCN passed last year at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Hawaii that created a definition for privately protected areas, which Kevin has asked me to speak to so that we can place the issue and the challenge of sustainable financing in that context. So a little bit of, of background, um, it all starts with the IUCN's definition of what a protected area is. So in the South African context, we understand protected areas based on our environmental legislation, based on NEMPA and the Protected Areas Act. But protected areas exist across the globe, and every country has different mechanisms, different legal frameworks, different legislation um, that they use to create protected areas. And what the IUCN has done is created this overarching standard for what a protected area is, and that allows countries to then report up to the WDPA. So from our own packet database, which records our protected areas, we can then report up on, on IT targets um, that go into the IUCN database. And so a protected area basically is a clearly defined geographical space that is recognized, dedicated and managed through legal or other effective means to achieve long-term conservation of nature and incorporating ecosystem services and cultural values. And I think it's a very nice overarching definition of what a protected area is. And this is further broken down into key categories. And the IUCN have a very nice table, um, which I haven't put up here, but you can go and look it up, um, that speaks to these different elements and breaks down this definition. So a country would then be able to look at their protected area and compare it with this criteria and determine, have we actually achieved a genuine protected area? So where do privately protected areas come in? Um, and I think James mentioned it in his talk this morning, is that privately protected areas are very underrepresented across the globe. They haven't received um, enough recognition, but they're providing an essential tool to add on to what we traditionally understand with protected areas. And so privately protected areas, um, determined by the IUCN definition, which got passed in a resolution last year, a privately protected area is basically just a protected area that is under private governance. And you can see the list there that speaks about the different categories of private governance. Um, so you can have individuals or groups of individuals, NGOs, corporations, for-profit profit companies, research entities, religious entities. And basically, if we have a protected area on privately owned land or privately managed land, it's going to be generally termed a privately protected area. So um, I love this. This is from um, the specialist group um, on privately protected areas. Um, and for me, this really sums up why privately protected areas are so important. And in the South African context, um, I think a lot of people in South Africa don't actually realize how strong our biodiversity stewardship model is in illustrating what a privately protected area is. And a lot of our case studies and a lot of the work on the ground that's gone on with biodiversity stewardship has led into this global process in defining what a privately protected area is. And basically, private protected areas are an essential component in achieving IT targets. And I think a lot of the graphs this morning and in Kevin's presentation have shown that. Um, and it helps us to create that ecologically representative protected area network, that we don't sit with islands, that we start to create corridors, that we start to create climate change resilience, ecological integrity, and so on. And particularly in the South African context, this is vital. 
Within our state-owned protected areas, there's considerable amounts of biodiversity as well as ecosystem services that are not represented in the traditional state-owned, state-managed protected areas. Hence, if we're going to target critical species like the blue swallow down the road here, um, or we're going to need to, to sort out the catchment areas in the Western Cape, those types of things, these are on privately owned land. We need to be able to create protected areas with private landowners. Um, and this creates the opportunity for voluntary contributions um, that complement the role of government that, and complement the role of communities. Uh, the other thing that Kevin asked me to discuss is not just what is a privately protected area, but what are the challenges facing privately protected areas. And I think we've addressed some of the solutions or potential solutions for addressing the main challenge. And in my mind, it really is the main challenge. And that's sustainable financing. When we talk about conservation finance, this isn't just about finding money um, to set up a site, finding money to declare a nature reserve, or finding money to draft a servitude. This is creating financing with a long-term lasting benefit that you can plow back into those sites that we don't end up with paper parks, or we don't end up with a whole bunch of things reported on Aichi Target, but when you actually get there, it's a golf course, or a millie field, or a mine. Um, and so sustainable financing is for the initiation, establishment, and maintenance of privately protected area sites. And why do we need sustainable financing? And maybe I'm preaching to the converted in this audience, and maybe it's intuitive. But basically, if you're looking at initiating and establishing a privately protected area site, which, in whichever form it happens, globally there are so many different models, but basically, this requires staff, it requires legal and professional skills, travel, etc., to set that site up. And so I think this is where we've been particularly good in South Africa in accessing whether it's government funding or it's been grants or it's been international funds or specific corporate CSI spend for projects to run out, engage with a landowner, declare a privately protected area in whichever form it happens, nature reserves, protected environments, or um, new servitudes that have been done recently. But what happens after that? What do we encounter once we've declared that site, when it actually goes through and becomes a nature reserve? Or even when we look at buffer zones and those areas, how do we harness financing so that they're effectively managed over time. And effective management is something that I like to hop on and on about um, because it's no use just having it in fact only and not actually in, in deed. And this is where the, the other challenge we face is with privately protected areas, you're leveraging private investment for management costs. So landowners are taking on the burden to incur management costs of privately protected areas and they lose impetus over time. If they're the ones plowing in those resources from their own private commercial operations into conservation management, and we're not able to meet them somewhere along that spectrum, we may not be able to meet them halfway, but we need to show that we have some type of, of input into that process, um, they lose the drive to continue managing those sites over time. And I know this from um, American counterparts in WWF as well, who are noticing that loss of enthusiasm on behalf of private landowners to incur management costs and keep those sites for what they were conserved for in the first place. So this really speaks to the third point there, which is medium to long-term commitment of landowners. Um, and this is being able to meet them, I, I feel, meet them in two direct ways. The one is financially. Do we have sufficient financial incentives to offset costs, to offset management costs, and to offset loss of production income or potential loss of production income? And two, can we meet them relationally? And so much research points to this. Having a warmed body conservationist on the ground to meet with landowners is also key. So how do we create financial sustainability mechanisms that answer these questions, that provide financial input to have effective management, to maintain landowner commitment over the long, medium to long term, 
but at the same time create sustainable financing that doesn't just speak to costs, but also speaks to relationship and speaks to having that conservationist on the ground, still having a cup of coffee with the landowner, still looking at management, still being able to audit those sites. Um, and for me, this is the key challenge that we're facing with privately protected areas. If they're going to continue to do what we know they can do, build corridor connectivity, establish ecological integrity, protect biodiversity, meet targets, et cetera, et cetera, we're going to have to answer this question. And I feel that today's session, we're looking at so many of those different options, but there is no silver bullet. It doesn't exist. Sometimes we hear something new and exciting from somewhere else. Uh, you know, I've had uh, inquiries from Chile and places like that on South Africa's tax incentive. And straight away you have to say, yes, we've had a success in tax, but it's not a silver bullet. You have to have all these different mechanisms. Right, so for us the challenge, and I think uh, this has been alluded to before, is that state money is dwindling. We're seeing budget cuts, we're seeing the state being under-resourced, and this isn't just a South African issue. This is happening everywhere, across the globe. And so when we start losing that big chunk that Kevin showed in the graph that speaks to public spend, as we start to lose that, we're faced with the additional challenge of having to be more innovative when it comes to sustainable financing. And so with NGOs, um, we're plugging that gap worldwide, not just in our own context. But the issue is that we face short-term funding cycles. I don't know if anyone has else has noticed that. Funders want to fund you three to five years, not understanding that conservation rewards come on a much longer time frame. So explaining that to corporates and so on is quite difficult. Um, and we don't seem to have been able to get around that. Then the private sector, by and large, um, their business and biodiversity mainstreaming is limited. It's a tick box exercise for the most part in terms of sustainability audits. How do we get large corporates and those with foot, large footprint and impact, how do we get them to see that investing in things like privately protected areas is actually mitigating things like supply chain risk? How do we mainstream biodiversity into business more? Um, and just generally, the global trend is that there's too little spent on biodiversity finance. Um, there's one uh, graphic that I, I love to show in presentations. I don't have it here, but we spend more on carbonated soft drinks than we do on biodiversity pr protection worldwide. I mean, that's astounding that we spend more on Coke and, you know, soda water than we would on biodiversity conservation. It, it seems ridiculously crazy, but that's the reality. So basically, we require unencumbered funds with a longer lifespan to effectively service privately protected areas, support voluntary landowners, and to ensure that our PPAs last and are effectively managed. That's the challenge that we're facing. So how do we create sustainable financing? And this is a very, very overarching high level. Kevin told me specifically not to be too technical. Um, so I'm aiming at not too technical today. Um, and we've seen examples of this, but to break it down into to what I call uh, the financing stool. So it's got those three legs to it. So the one is structured finance, which is where I fit in, and that's fiscal. Things like tax and municipal rebates, where you really need a legal framework and dedicated expertise. So South Africa fortunately has a strong enough legal framework for us to have introduced environmental and biodiversity based tax incentives that can start to contribute to addressing the sustainable financing challenge. And like I said, not a silver bullet, it's one element of it, it's one solution and we've been able to do that successfully. Then there's investment finance, whether it's endowment funds, green bonds or yellow bonds because often they're not very green, but um, revolving funds, these types of things. So it's starting to look at different types of investment mechanisms. And I think sometimes for conservationists or environmentalists, this is very daunting. This is a whole world that we haven't really thought about enough. Um, and it often requires intensive capital investment and again, dedicated expertise to get it off the ground. That initial capital injection is what you need so that things start churning over time. And then it's what I like to call, and this is my own term, this is not, uh, this is a candicism, um, is innovation finance, where the sky is the limit. And this is site specific and it's based on profitability. And this is things that 
Things like trail runs. All of a sudden, trail running becomes this hot trend and everyone wants to put on a pair of Solomons and be a mountain goat and gallop over some indigenous area. It's not, not my cup of tea, but it's <laughs> for other people. And so it attracts so many people into an area that's beautiful to look at and it's pristine. And so we're starting to see things like mountain biking or trail runs bringing in an additional amount of profitability to a conservation area that can then be plowed back into management. And who would have thought like this, but it can be done in specific contexts. Um, and this is really comes down to having local champions, access to markets, appropriateness for the site that you're in, and profitability potential. Some areas are not going to work for trail runs, but others are. Right, so just to, to bring it back to tax, because I can't avoid tax altogether. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is really just my tips based on the South African success story around biodiversity tax incentives. We sat with a position where we had the incentives locked into legislation, but they weren't working. There was no utilization, there was no uptake. Um, and so when I stepped out of the corporate sector and, and into the conservation world, my background is in tax, particularly on tax incentives. And so I was able to address this from a very dedicated point of view and get them back up and running so that now we sit with a position where we have amended legislation, we've tested the new tax incentives, um, and they can actually be applied to landowners. They've been processed in tax returns and are starting to provide a legitimate tangible benefit to landowners that declare private, pr privately protected areas in South Africa. And so this structured finance aspect of fiscal benefits, um, we have successfully addressed the challenge that we had in South Africa and we've answered that. And the tips that I have on this, um, and it's really my take home for today, is that these challenges may seem insurmountable or daunting or we don't have the right skill set, but they can be done. We can address these issues one at a time in a focused, dedicated way um, and building a collaborative network around it. Um, and through that, we can start to tick off those boxes and bring in all the different elements and mechanisms for financial sustainability. So my tips are a focused approach. Um, a dedicated skill set. Um, so when it comes down to revolving funds or BEE, bring in an expert. Bring in somebody who understands BEE. You can't expect an ecologist to overnight become a tax specialist. It's not going to happen. Um, in the same way that I can't scamper off into some grassland and tell you how many head of cattle they need to be. Like, I pull in the science guys to do that. <laughs> That's not my skill set. Um, and then the other thing, and this is where South Africa has been particularly strong, is a collaborative network. We have a fantastic collaborative network around biodiversity stewardship and, and all the other elements that fit in. And that has enabled us to, to get the tax stuff to work. Um, the other thing that I've been particularly focused on is pro bono professional services. So I pull in all sorts of lawyers for different bits and pieces. I've pulled in corporates to do pro bono tax advice, um, these different types of things. And they're actually a lot more approachable than we would think. Uh, we don't have to do it in a silo. We don't have to sit in conservation and just do it here. There, we can start to build bridges into different sectors and pull in those resources and expertise. Um, and then my last tip is about stakeholder buy-in. So I was fortunate enough to have the buy-in of National Treasury, to have the buy-in of SARS, to have the buy-in of DEER, to have the buy-in of provinces and NGOs, and that was crucial. Right, so I, I hope that um, enables you to just take a little bit home about what we can actually achieve when we're focused on sustainable financing. <laughs>